Throne and Liberty is an open-world, tab-target, medieval fantasy MMORPG developed by NCSoft, often described as the spiritual successor to the Lineage series. It's been just over a year since the release of the official trailer, and in that time, the video has received close to 9.5 million views, making it arguably the most anticipated MMORPG in 2023. To say it's been a long time coming would be an understatement. The game was first announced in 2011 under the name Lineage Eternal and was meant to be the long-awaited sequel to Lineage 2. Initially, the game was designed as a 3D isometric action combat MMORPG similar to Lost Ark, but after performing a closed beta in 2016 that I can only assume went poorly, the development team was restructured, the lead director was replaced, and development was moved from the in-house engine used to make Guild Wars to Unreal Engine 4. A few months later, during the 2017 Director's Cut event, it was also revealed that Lineage Eternal had been renamed to Project TL, short for The Lineage. However, after many years of silence in 2021, we learned through an investor presentation that Project TL would be developed as an entirely new IP, and eventually we are told that the game's name had yet again been changed from The Lineage to Throne and Liberty. Finally, in March 2022, NCSoft released the trailers for both Throne and Liberty and Project E, describing the two games as newly designed original IPs that share the same worldview, both taking place on the same planet but in two different continents, with Throne and Liberty taking place on the western medieval continent Cilicium, while Project E takes place on the eastern medieval continent Lysag. Over the past year, the developers have held a handful of interviews and published a couple of new videos giving us some much needed insight into the world of Throne and Liberty. So, what can we expect from this MMORPG? According to the new director, Throne and Liberty offers a dynamic world with boundless freedom, in which you can create your own legendary stories with a heavy focus on working as a group by forming a community around guilds to overcome a variety of challenges and competitions. The word throne refers to the battle community with its competitions and combat, while liberty refers to the freedom to seek out your own adventures in the vast game world. Character customization options will be fairly complex fitting of any Korean MMO, and you will be able to change your character's appearance at any time in-game. There will also be an AI character creator feature, allowing you to make a character based on an uploaded picture. Some players may be disappointed to learn that humans are the only playable race, but there will also be a player transformation system known as Morphs, allowing you to change your character's appearance. It appears there are two types of player transformations, Polymorphs and Transmorphs. My understanding is that transmorphs are animal transformations used for traveling similar to mounts while polymorphs appear to be some sort of skin, granting player buffs similar to those found in the Lineage series. There are a variety of morphs that can be used for traveling on land, in the air, and through the sea, including eagles, crows, geese, kirin, panthers, saber-toothed tigers, wolves, and sharks. There are even siege golems which players can transform into during siege wars for breaking down walls and transporting large groups of players. In one of the boss fights, we even see players getting launched into the air by an attack and turning into birds mid-air, which leads me to believe these morphs will have a strategic utility in specific fights. I'm happy to see a company innovating on the role that mounts play in the genre by giving the system more utility beyond transportation. Fast travel appears to be limited. There seems to be an emphasis on players using these animal transformation skills rather than mounts to traverse the environment. There will also be some form of vaulting and a grappling hook to reach higher elevations, which should help to make movement in this game feel fun and engaging. As for classes, Throne and Liberty will have a classless system similar to New World, where your role is determined by the weapons that you use. Weapons will have proficiency levels, making them stronger as their level increases. You will be able to equip and switch between two different weapons, and depending on the weapon, your skill set also changes. Currently, we know of at least seven different weapon types, including the Greatsword, Longbow, Dual Crossbows, Magical Staff, Wand and Tome, Dual Daggers, and the Sword and Shield. In a move that I find interesting, to say the least, the developers have decided to go with a tab-targeting combat system. I know this is a major point of contention for many players, and I don't know why they decided to go with tab-targeting over action combat, but I wouldn't be surprised if it had something to do with optimization for large-scale battles. After all, what's the point of having an action combat system in an MMO if it falls apart during large-scale battles, especially in an MMO that is designed around large-scale PvP battles such as Castle Sieges? So for now, I'll withhold my judgment and hope for the best. 
Throne and Liberty will take place in a seamless open world with varied vertical terrain, including underground dungeons with multiple entrances and multiple floors, seamlessly connected in which aid can be given and damage can be dealt to players on different floors. Gigantrites are small islands that appear randomly on the map, lasting for 30 minutes, that grant access to hidden areas such as special dungeons. Since the backs of these flying whales are treated as terrain, all battles including PvP can take place on them. The world is said to be built upon three pillars, the environment, regional events, and memorials. The first pillar, and the system I'm most excited for, is the environment. The game will have a day-night cycle and a weather system that will cause small but meaningful changes in both the environment and player behavior. The day-night cycle will last 4 and 1 hours, new monsters will appear at night that aren't present during the day, passive monsters may become more aggressive during the night, and field bosses' strength and loot tables will also change depending on whether it is day or night. In addition to this, certain weapon skills are granted different abilities during the day versus the night. The weather system consists of two elements, wind and rain. The ratio of sunny to rainy weather will be 4 to 1, with sunny weather lasting 2 hours and rainy weather lasting 30 minutes. Rain will also affect the environment by causing water levels to rise, allowing players to swim across areas that were previously inaccessible and granting access to dungeons. Some bosses will get stronger when it rains, and depending on the weather, their loot tables will also change. The weather system will also affect weapon skills. In this example, we can see a lightning skill chain to additional enemies when it's raining. Wind direction and speed will also play a minor role by increasing the distance of long-range projectiles. Finally, there are a number of high-level skills that allow a select group of players to change the environment for 10 minutes up to twice a day. The second pillar, regional events, are competitions in which all players in a region can participate. These open world events are largely divided into PvP and PvE content and can be viewed from a schedule in-game occurring every 3 hours and lasting for 20 minutes. An example of a regional event is the wolf hunting contest, in which players compete to catch a wolf and acquire a wolf tail. The number of tails you have is displayed above your head, and you can steal other players' tails by engaging in PvP. The more tails you have, the higher your rank, and the better your reward. There will also be a variety of open world bosses at varying levels. These battles are said to require some amount of strategy and coordination, and as previously mentioned, their strength and loot tables will change depending on the weather and the day-night cycle. PvP will also be possible during these boss battles, which should keep things exciting. While we are on the topic, it should be noted that open world PvP will be optional to an extent. According to the devs, most of the zones will be safe zones. However, once competitions like regional events or boss raids begin, those zones will become combat zones, in which PvP will become active. In addition to this, there are two types of large-scale PvP content that guilds can participate in, Occupational Wars and Siege Wars. Occupational wars appear to be smaller open world battles over field objectives. Guilds will be fighting over two objects, the Blessing Stone and the Dimension Stone. Acquiring these stones will grant certain benefits to the controlling guild such as increased materials from gathering. Siege wars appear to be larger scale battles in which guilds will be fighting over castles, with one guild defending while the other is attacking. Special skills will allow players to transform into siege golems for breaking down walls and transporting large groups of players, and as previously noted, special skills will allow players to change the environment for a short period of time. The third and final pillar, Memorials, are a type of dynamic content which opens up sequentially according to player progress. Memorials are described as a major turning point for world events that takes place on each server independently. When players meet certain conditions, all players on the server move on to the next phase of the event. The best comparison seems to be Ashes of Creation's story arc system, in which server-wide events are triggered after certain conditions are met. Personally, I'm really looking forward to this next generation of MMOs, in which each server will have a different world based on the collective decisions made by each server's community. Perhaps the most controversial topic in the community is autoplay, a feature that allows players to automate certain activities like farming mobs for resources. Most of these concerns have come from players' interpretations of certain icons in the UI that look very similar to the autoplay buttons found in other NCSoft MMOs. Having said that, this feature has not yet been confirmed or denied by the developers, so we'll just have to wait and see. Currently, very little is known about the game's monetization model, but that hasn't stopped players from questioning whether the game will be paid to win. Although the devs have tried to reassure players by saying there won't be any features obtainable only by swiping, they have confirmed that players will be able to pay for certain benefits, explaining that microtransactions will allow players who are short on time to stay competitive with those who have more time to play the game. If you're still watching this video, by now you're probably wondering, when and where can I play this game? 
Throne and Liberty will be available on both PC and console, including the Xbox Series X and S and PlayStation 5. In addition to this, the ability to play on mobile will be possible by streaming through NCSoft's Purple app. And while the developers have said in past interviews that cross-platform play is unlikely, the recent announcement by Amazon to publish the game in the West seems to indicate otherwise. As for an official release date, it was recently announced during NCSoft's first quarter conference call that the company is aiming to launch the game globally in the second half of 2023. NCSoft also said that they are working closely with Amazon Games to perform a global beta test which will take place sometime after the week-long Korean closed beta test starting on May 24th. If I had to guess, I think we could see a global beta test by Amazon as early as July or August, with a global release likely in September or October. So, should you be hyped for Throne and Liberty? I suppose the answer to that question depends on your tolerance for group content and PvP. Everything we know about the game seems to indicate it will be heavily focused around forming guilds and large-scale PvP such as the Castle Sieges that the Lineage series are known for. If the game ends up being plagued with predatory pay-to-win features and auto-hunting bots, then so be it. Personally, I'm looking forward to exploring this new open world and the high that comes with the launch of any new MMO. At the very least, it should be fun for the first couple of months while the honeymoon phase is in full effect. Anyway, that's it for this video. Let me know your thoughts on Throne and Liberty in the comment section below. What are you most looking forward to in this game, and what are your biggest concerns? If you found this video helpful, feel free to give it a like for the algorithm. Thanks again for watching, and see you in the next one.